Chapter One, Part Two of A Group of Noble Dames by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. Dame the First, the First Countess of Wessex, by the local historian. Part Two. Meanwhile, the first letter from Reynard, announcing to Mrs. Dornell and her husband jointly that he was coming in a few days, had sped on its way to Falls Park. It was directed under cover to Tupcombe, the confidential servant, with instructions not to put it into his master's hands till he had been refreshed by a good long sleep. Tupcombe much regretted his commission, letters sent in this way always disturbing the squire, but guessing that it would be infinitely worse in the end to withhold the news than to reveal it, he chose his time, which was early the next morning, and delivered the missive. The utmost effect that Mrs. Dornell had anticipated from the message was a peremptory order from her husband to Reynard to hold aloof a few months longer. What the squire really did was to declare that he would go himself and confront Reynard at Bristol, and to have it out with him there by word of mouth. "'But, master,' said Tupcombe, "'you can't. You cannot get out of bed.' "'You leave the room, Tupcombe, and don't say can't before me. Have Jerry saddled in an hour.' The long-tried Tupcombe thought his employer demented, so utterly helpless was his appearance just then, and he went out reluctantly. No sooner was he gone than the squire, with great difficulty, stretched himself over to a cabinet by the bedside, unlocked it, and took out a small bottle. It contained a gout specific, against whose use he had been repeatedly warned by his regular physician, but whose warning he now cast to the winds. He took a double dose and waited half an hour. It seemed to produce no effect. He then poured out a treble dose, swallowed it, leant back upon his pillow, and waited. The miracle he anticipated had been worked at last. It seemed as though the second draught had not only operated with its own strength, but had kindled into power the latent effects of the first. He put away the bottle and rang up Tupcombe. Less than an hour later, one of the housemaids, who of course was quite aware that the squire's illness was serious, was surprised to hear a bold and decided step descending the stair from the direction of Mr. Dornell's room, accompanied by the humming of a tune. She knew that the doctor had not paid a visit that morning, and that it was too heavy to be the valet or any other manservant. Looking up, she saw Squire Dornell fully dressed, descending towards her in his drab-caped riding-coat and boots, with the swinging easy movement of his prime. Her face expressed her amazement. "'What the devil beast looking at?' asked the squire. "'Did you never see a man walk out of his house before, wench?' Resuming his humming, which was of a defiant sort, he proceeded to the library, rang the bell, asked if the horses were ready, and directed them to be brought round. Ten minutes later he rode away in the direction of Bristol, Tupcombe behind him, trembling at what these movements might portend. They rode on through the pleasant woodlands and the monotonous straight lanes at an equal pace. The distance traversed might have been about fifteen miles when Tupcombe could perceive that the squire was getting tired, as weary as he would have been after riding three times the distance ten years before. However, they reached Bristol without any mishap, and put up at the squire's accustomed inn. Dornell almost immediately proceeded on foot to the inn which Reynard had given as his address, it now being about four o'clock. Reynard had already dined, for people dined early then, and he was staying indoors. He had already received Mrs. Dornell's reply to his letter, but before acting upon her advice and starting for King's Hintock, he made up his mind to wait another day, that Betty's father might at least have the time to write to him if so minded. The returned traveller much desired to obtain the squire's assent, as well as his wife's, to the proposed visit to his bride, that nothing might seem harsh or forced in his method of taking his position as one of the family. But though he anticipated some sort of objection from his father-in-law, in consequence of Mrs. Dornell's warning, he was surprised at the announcement of the squire in person. Stephen Reynard formed the completest of possible contrasts to Dornell as they stood confronting each other in the best parlour of the Bristol Tavern. The squire, hot-tempered, gouty, impulsive, generous, reckless. The younger man, pale, tall, sedate, self-possessed, a man of the world, fully bearing out at least one couplet in his epitaph, still extant in King's Hintock Church, 
which places in the inventory of his good qualities, engaging manners, cultivated mind, adorned by letters, and in courts refined. He was at that time about five-and-thirty, though careful living and an even unemotional temperament caused him to look much younger than his years. Squire Dornell plunged into his errand without much ceremony or preface. "'I am your humble servant, sir,' he said. "'I have read your letter writ to my wife and myself, and considered that the best way to answer it would be to do so in person. "'I am vastly honoured by your visit, sir,' said Mr. Stephen Reynard, bowing. "'Well, what's done can't be undone,' said Dornell. "'Though it was mighty early, and no doing of mine, "'she's your wife, and there's an end on it. "'But in brief, sir, she's too young for you to claim yet. "'We mustn't reckon by years. "'We must reckon by nature. "'She's still a girl. "'Tis unpolite of you to come yet. "'Next year will be full soon enough for you to take her to you.' "'Now, as courteous as Reynard could be, he was a little obstinate when his resolution had once been formed. She had been promised him by her eighteenth birthday at latest, sooner if she were in robust health. Her mother had fixed the time on her own judgment, without a word of interference on his part. He had been hanging about foreign courts till he was weary. Betty was now a woman, if she would ever be one, and there was not in his mind the shadow of an excuse for putting him off longer. Therefore, Fortified as he was by the support of her mother, he blandly but firmly told the squire that he had been willing to waive his rights out of deference to her parents to any reasonable extent, but must now, in justice to himself and her, insist on maintaining them. He therefore, since she had not come to meet him, should proceed to King's Hintock in a few days to fetch her. This announcement, in spite of the urbanity with which it was delivered, set Dornell in a passion. "'Oh, damn me, sir! You talk about rights, you do, after stealing her away, a mere child, against my will and knowledge. If we'd begged and prayed ye to take her, you could say no more.' "'Upon my honour, your charge is quite baseless, sir,' said his son-in-law. "'You must know by this time, or if you do not, it has been a monstrous, cruel injustice to me that I should not have been allowed to remain in your mind with such a stain upon my character.' "'You must know that I used no seductiveness or temptation of any kind. "'Her mother assented. She assented. "'I took them at their word. "'That you were really opposed to the marriage was not known to me till afterwards.' "'Dornell professed to believe not a word of it. "'You shan't have her till she's dree sixes full. "'No maid ought to be married till she's dree sixes. "'And my daughter shan't be treated out of nature.' So he stormed on till Topcombe, who had been alarmedly listening in the next room, entered suddenly, declaring to Reynard that his master's life was in danger if the interview were prolonged, he being subject to apoplectic strokes at these crises. Reynard immediately said that he would be the last to wish to injure Squire Dornell, and left the room. And as soon as the squire had recovered breath and equanimity, he went out of the inn, leaning on the arm of Topcombe. Tupcombe was for sleeping in Bristol that night, but Dornell, whose energy seemed invincible as it was sudden, insisted upon mounting and getting back as far as Falls Park to continue the journey to King's Hintock on the following day. At five they started, and took the southern road toward the Mendip Hills. The evening was dry and windy, and, excepting that the sun did not shine, strongly reminded Tupcombe of the evening of that March month, nearly five years earlier, when news had been brought to King Hintock's court of the child Betty's marriage in London, news which had produced upon Dornell such a marked effect for the worse ever since, and indirectly upon the house of which he was the head. Before that time, winters were lively at Falls Park as well as at King's Hintock, although the squire had ceased to make it his regular residence. Hunting guests and shooting guests came and went, and open house was kept, Tupcombe disliked the clever courtier who had put a stop in this by taking away from the squire the only treasure he valued. It grew dark with their progress along the lanes, and Tupcombe discovered from Mr. Dornell's manner of riding that his strength was giving way, and spurring his own horse close alongside, he asked him how he felt. "'Oh, bad, damn bad, Tupcombe. I can hardly keep my seat. I shall never feel any better, I fear.' 
"'Have we passed three-man gibbet yet?' "'Not yet by a long way, sir. "'I wish we had. "'I can hardly hold on.' "'The squire could not repress a groan now and then, "'and Tupcombe knew he was in great pain. "'I wish I was underground. "'That's the place for such fools as I. "'I'd gladly be there were it not for Mistress Betty. "'He's coming on to King's Hintock to-morrow. "'He won't put it off any longer.' He'll set out and reach there tomorrow night without stopping at Falls, and he'll take her unawares, and I want to be there before him. I hope you may be well enough to do it, sir, but really, I must stop come. You don't know what my trouble is. It is not so much that she is married to this man without my agreeing, for after all, there's nothing to say against him, so far as I know. But that she don't take to him at all, seems to fear him. In fact, cares nothing about him. If he comes forcing himself into the house upon her, twill be rank cruelty. Would to the Lord something would happen to prevent him. How they reached home that night, Topcombe hardly knew. The squire was in such pain that he was obliged to recline upon his horse, and Topcombe was afraid at every moment lest he would fall into the road. But they did reach home at last, and Mr. Dornell was instantly assisted to bed. Next morning it was obvious that he could not possibly go to King's Hintock for several days at least, and there on the bed he lay, cursing his inability to proceed on an errand so personal and so delicate that no emissary could perform it. What he wished to do was to ascertain from Betty's own lips if her aversion to Reynard was so strong that his presence would be positively distasteful to her. Were that the case, he would have borne her away bodily on the saddle behind him. But all that was hindered now, and he repeated a hundred times in Tupcombe's hearing, and in that of the nurse and other servants, I wish to God something would happen to him. This sentiment, reiterated by the squire as he tossed in the agony induced by the powerful drugs of the day before, entered sharply into the soul of Tupcombe, and of all who were attached to the house of Dornell, as distinct from the house of his wife at King's Hintock. Topcombe, who was an excitable man, was hardly less disquieted by the thought of Reynard's return than the squire himself was. As the week drew on, and the afternoon advanced at which Reynard would in all probability be passing near Falls on his way to the court, the squire's feelings became acuter, and the responsive Topcombe could hardly bear to come near him. Having left him in the hands of the doctor, the former went out upon the lawn, for he could hardly breathe in the contagion of excitement caught from the employer, who had virtually made him his confidant. He had lived with the Dornells from his boyhood, had been born under the shadows of their walls, his whole life was annexed and welded to the life of the family, in a degree which has no counterpart in these latter days. He was summoned indoors, and learnt that it had been decided to send for Mrs. Dornell, her husband was in great danger. There were two or three who could have acted as messenger, but Dornell wished Topcombe to go, the reason showing itself when, Topcombe being ready to start, Squire Dornell summoned him to his chamber, and leaned down so he could whisper in his ear, "'Put Peggy along smart, Topcombe, and get there before him, you know, before him. This is the day he fixed. He has not passed Falls Cross Roads yet. If you can do that, you will be able to get better to come, do you see?' After her mother has started, she'll have a reason for not waiting for him. Bring her by the lower road. He'll go by the upper. Your business is to make a miss each other, d'ye see? But that's a thing I couldn't write down. Five minutes after, Topcombe was astride the horse and on his way, the way he had followed so many times since his master, a florid young countryman, had first gone wooing to King's Hintock Court. As soon as he had crossed the hills in the immediate neighbourhood of the manor, the road lay over a plain where it ran in long straight stretches for several miles. In the best of times, when all had been gay in the united houses, that part of the road had seemed tedious. It was gloomy in the extreme now that he pursued it, at night and alone, on such an errand. He rode and brooded. If the squire were to die, he, Tupcombe, would be alone in the world and friendless, for he was no favourite with Mrs. Dornell, and to find himself baffled, after all, in what he had set his mind to, would probably kill the squire. Thinking thus, Tupcombe stopped his horse every now and then, 
and listened for the coming husband. The time was drawing on to the moment when Reynard might be expected to pass along this very route. He had watched the road well during the afternoon, and had inquired of the tavern keepers as he came up to each, and he was convinced that the premature descent of the stranger husband upon his young mistress had not been made by this highway as yet. Besides the girl's mother, Tupcombe was the only member of the household who suspected Betty's tender feelings towards young Phillipson, so unhappily generated on her return from school, and he could therefore imagine, even better than her fond father, what would be her emotions on the sudden announcement of Reynard's advent that evening at King's Hintock Court. So he rode and rode, desponding and hopeful by turns. He felt assured that unless in the unfortunate event of the almost immediate arrival of her son-in-law at his own heels, Mrs. Dornell would not be able to hinder Betty's departure for her father's bedside. It was about nine o'clock, having put twenty miles of country behind him, he turned in at the lodge gates nearest to Ival and King's Hintock village, and pursued the long north drive, itself much like a turnpike road, which led thence through the park to the court. There were so many trees in King's Hintock Park, few bordered on the carriage roadway. He could see it stretching ahead in the pale night light, like an unrolled deal shaving. Presently, the irregular frontage of the house came in view, of great extent, but low, except where it rose into the outlines of a broad square tower. As Tupcombe approached, he rode aside upon the grass to make sure, if possible, that he was the first comer, before letting his presence be known. The court was dark and sleepy, in no respect as if a bridegroom were about to arrive. While pausing, he distinctly heard the tread of a horse upon the track behind him, and for a moment despaired of arriving in time. Here, surely, was Reynard. Pulling up closer to the densest tree at hand, he waited, and found he had retreated nothing too soon, for the second rider avoided the gravel also and passed quite close to him. In the profile he recognized young Phelipson. Before Tupcombe could think what to do, Phelipson had gone out, but not to the door of the house. Swerving to the left, he passed round to the east angle, where, as Tupcombe knew, were situated Betty's apartments. Dismounting, he left the horse tethered to a hanging bough, and walked on to the house. Suddenly, his eye caught sight of an object which explained the position immediately. It was a ladder, stretching from beneath the trees, which there came pretty close to the house, up to a first-floor window, one which lighted Miss Betty's rooms. Yes, it was Betty's chamber. He knew every room in the house well. The young horseman who had passed him, having evidently left his steed somewhere under the trees also, was perceptible at the top of the ladder, immediately outside Betty's window. While Tupcombe watched, a cloaked female figure stepped timidly over the sill, and the two cautiously descended, one before the other, the young man's arms enclosing the young woman between his grasp of the ladder, so that she could not fall. As soon as they reached the bottom, young Phelipson quickly removed the ladder and hid it under the bushes. The pair disappeared, till in a few minutes Tapcombe could discern a horse emerging from a remoter part of the umbrage. The horse carried double, the girl being on a pillion behind her lover. Tapcombe hardly knew what to do or think, yet, though this was not exactly the kind of flight that had been intended, she had certainly escaped. He went back to his own animal, and rode round to the servant's door, where he delivered the letter for Mrs. Dornell. To leave a verbal message for Betty was now impossible. The court servants desired him to stay over the night, but he would not do so, desiring to get back to the squire as soon as possible and tell him what he had seen. Whether he ought to have intercepted the young people and carried off Betty himself to her father, he did not know. However, it was too late to think of that now, and without wetting his lips or swallowing a crumb, Tupcombe turned his back upon King's Hintock Court. It was not until he had advanced a considerable distance on his way homeward that, halting under the lantern of a roadside inn while the horse was watered, there came a traveller from the opposite direction in a hired coach. The lantern lit the stranger's face as he passed along and dropped into the shade. Tupcombe exulted for the moment, though he could hardly have justified his exultation. The belated traveller was Reynard, 
and another had stepped in before him. "'You may now be willing to know of the fortunes of Miss Betty. Left much to herself through the intervening days, she had ample time to brood over her desperate attempt at the stratagem of infection, thwarted, apparently, by her mother's promptitude. In what other way to gain time she could not think. Thus drew on the day and the hour of the evening on which her husband was expected to announce himself. At some period after dark, which she could not tell, a tap at the window, twice and thrice repeated, became audible. It caused her to start up, for the only visitant in her mind was the one whose advances she had so feared as to risk health and life to repel them. She crept to the window, and heard a whisper without. "'It is I, Charlie,' said the voice. Betty's face fired with excitement. She had latterly begun to doubt her admirer's staunchness, fancying his love to be going off in mere attentions which neither committed him nor herself very deeply. She opened the window, saying in a joyous whisper, "'Oh, Charlie, I thought you had deserted me quite.' He assured her that he had not done that, and he had a horse in waiting, if she would ride off with him. "'You must come quickly,' he said, "'for Reynard's on the way.' To throw a cloak round herself was the work of a moment, and assuring herself that her door was locked against a surprise, she climbed over the window-sill and descended with him as we have seen. Her mother, meanwhile, having received Topcombe's note, found the news of her husband's illness so serious as to displace her thoughts of the coming son-in-law, and she hastened to tell her daughter of the squire's dangerous condition, thinking it might be desirable to take her to her father's bedside. On trying the door of the girl's room, she found it still locked. Mrs. Dornell called, but there was no answer. Full of misgivings, she privately fetched the old house steward and bade him to burst open the door, an order by no means easy to execute, the joinery of the court being massively constructed. However, the lock sprang open at last, and she entered Betty's chamber, only to find the window unfastened and the bird flown. For a moment Mrs. Dornell was staggered. Then it occurred to her that Betty might have privately obtained from Topcombe the news of her father's serious illness, and fearing she might be kept back to meet her husband, have gone off with that obstinate and biased servitor to Falls Park. The more she thought it over, the more probable did the supposition appear, and binding her own headman to secrecy as to Betty's movements, whether as she conjectured or otherwise, Mrs. Dornell herself prepared to set out. She had no suspicion of how seriously her husband's malady had been aggravated by his ride to Bristol, and thought more of Betty's affairs than of her own. That Betty's husband should arrive by some other road to-night, and find neither wife nor mother-in-law to receive him, and no explanations of their absence, was possible. But never forgetting chances, Mrs. Dornell, as she journeyed, kept her eyes fixed upon the highway on the off-side, where, before she had reached the town of Ivell, the hired coach containing Stephen Reynard flashed into the lamplight of her own carriage. Mrs. Dornell's coachman pulled up, in obedience to a direction she had given him, at starting. The other coach was hailed, a few words passed, and Reynard alighted and came to Mrs. Dornell's carriage window. "'Come inside,' says she. "'I want to speak privately to you. Why are you so late?' "'One hindrance and another,' says he. I meant to be at court by eight at latest. My gratitude for your letter, I hope. You must not try to see Betty yet, said she. There be far other and newer reasons against your seeing her now than there were when I wrote. The circumstances were such that Mrs. Dornell could not possibly conceal them entirely. Nothing short of knowing some of the facts would prevent his blindly acting in a manner which might be fatal to the future. Moreover, there are times when deeper intriguers than Mrs. Dornell feel they must let out a few truths, if only in self-indulgence. She told so much of recent surprises as that Betty's heart had been attracted by another image than his, and that his insisting on visiting her now might drive the girl to desperation. "'Betty has, in fact, rushed off to her father to avoid you,' she said. "'But if you wait, she will soon forget this young man, and you will have nothing to fear.' As a woman and a mother she could go no further. 
and Betty's desperate attempt to infect herself the week before as a means of repelling him, together with the alarming possibility that, after all, she had not gone to her father, but to her lover, was not revealed. Well, sighed the diplomatist, in a tone unexpectedly quiet, such things have been known before. After all, she may prefer me to him some day, when she reflects how very differently I might have acted than I am going to act to her. But I'll say no more about that now. I can have a bed at your house for tonight. Tonight, certainly. And you leave tomorrow morning early. She spoke anxiously, for on no account did she wish him to make further discoveries. My husband is so seriously ill, she continued, that my absence and Betty's on your arrival is naturally accounted for. He promised to leave early and to write to her soon. And when I think the time is ripe, he said, I'll write to her. I may have something to tell her that will bring her to graciousness. It was about one o'clock in the morning when Mrs. Dornell reached Falls Park. A double blow awaited her there. Betty had not arrived, her flight had been elsewhither, and her stricken mother divined with whom. She ascended to the bedside of her husband, where, to her concern, she found that the physician had given up all hope. The squire was sinking, and his extreme weakness had almost changed his character, except in the particular that his old obstinacy sustained him in a refusal to see a clergyman. He shed tears at the least word, and sobbed at the sight of his wife. He asked for Betty, and it was with a heavy heart that Mrs. Dornell told him that the girl had not accompanied her. "'He is not keeping her away. No, no, he is going back. He is not coming to her for some time. Then what is detaining her, cruel, neglectful maid? No, no, Thomas, she is... she could not come. How's that?' Somehow the solemnity of these last moments of his gave him inquisitorial power, and the too cold wife could not conceal from him the flight which had taken place from King's Hintock that night. To her amazement, the effect upon him was electrical. What? Betty, a trump after all? Hurrah! She's her father's own maid. She's game. She knew what he was. She knew he was her father's own choice. She vowed that my man should win. Well done, Bet. Ha, ha, hurrah! He had raised himself in bed by starts as he spoke, and now fell back exhausted. He never uttered another word, and died before the dawn. People said there had not been such an ungenteel death in a good county family for years. Now I will go back to the time of Betty's riding off on the pillion behind her lover. They left the park by an obscure gate to the east, and presently found themselves in the lonely and solitary length of the old Roman road, now called Long Ash Lane. By this time they were rather alarmed at their own performance, for they were both young and inexperienced. Hence they proceeded almost in silence till they came to a mean roadside inn, which was not yet closed, when Betty, who had held on to him with much misgiving all this while, felt dreadfully unwell, and said she thought she would like to get down. They accordingly dismounted from the jaded animal that had brought them, and were shown into a small dark parlour, where they stood side by side awkwardly, like the fugitives they were. A light was brought, and when they were left alone, Betty threw off the cloak which had enveloped her. No sooner did young Phillipson see her face than he uttered an alarmed exclamation. "'Why, Lord, Lord, you are sickening for the smallpox!' he cried. "'Oh, I forgot,' faltered Betty. And then she informed him that on hearing of her husband's approach the week before, in a desperate attempt to keep him from her side, she had tried to imbibe the infection. An act which, till this moment, she had supposed to have been ineffectual, imagining her feverishness to be the result of her excitement. The effect of this discovery upon young Phillipson was overwhelming. Better seasoned men than he would not have been proof against it, and he was only a little over her own age. "'And you've been holding on to me,' he said. "'And suppose you get worse, and we both have it. What shall we do? Won't you be a fright in a month or two, poor, poor Betty?' In his horror he attempted to laugh, but the laugh ended in a weakly giggle. She was more woman than girl by this time, and realized his feeling. "'What? 
"'In trying to keep him off, I keep off you,' she said miserably. "'Do you hate me because I'm going to be ugly and ill?' "'Oh, no, no,' he said soothingly. "'But I—I I am thinking if it is quite right for us to do this. "'You see, dear Betty, if you was not married it would be different. "'You are not in honour married to him, we've often said. "'Still you are his by law, and you can't be mine whilst he's still alive. "'And with this terrible sickness coming on, "'perhaps you'd better let me take you back and climb in at the window again.' "'Is this your love?' said Betty reproachfully. "'Oh, if it was you sickening for the plague itself, "'and going to be as ugly as the oozer in the church vestry, "'I wouldn't. No, no, you mistake upon my soul.' "'But Betty, with a swollen heart, had rewrapped herself and gone out of the door. "'The horse was still standing there. "'She mounted by the help of the upping-stock, "'and when he had followed her, she said, "'Do not come near me, Charlie.' "'but please lead the horse, so that if you've not caught anything already, "'you'll not catch it going back. "'After all, what keeps off you may keep off him. "'Now, onward.' "'He did not resist her command, and back they went the way they had come, "'Betty shedding bitter tears at the retribution she had already brought upon herself, "'for though she reproached Phelipson, "'she was staunch enough not to blame him in her secret heart "'for showing that his love was only skin-deep.' The horse was stopped in the plantation, and they walked silently to the lawn, reaching the bushes wherein the ladder still lay. "'Will you put it up for me?' she asked mournfully. He re-erected the ladder without a word, but when she approached to ascend, he said, "'Good-bye, Betty.' "'Good-bye,' said she, and involuntarily turned her face towards his. He hung back from imprinting the expected kiss, at which Betty started as if she had received a poignant wound. She moved away so suddenly that he hardly had time to follow her up the ladder to prevent her falling. "'Tell your mother to get the doctor at once,' he said anxiously. She stepped in without looking behind. He descended, withdrew the ladder, and went away. Alone in her chamber, Betty flung herself upon her face on the bed and burst into shaking sobs, Yet she would not admit to herself that her lover's conduct was unreasonable, only that her rash act of the previous week had been wrong. No one had heard her enter, and she was too worn out in body and mind to think or care about medical aid. In an hour or so she felt yet more unwell, positively ill, and nobody coming to her at the usual bedtime, she looked towards the door. Marks of the lock having been forced were visible— and this made her cherry of summoning a servant. She opened the door cautiously, and sallied forth downstairs. In the dining parlour, as it was called, the now sick and sorry Betty was startled to see at the late hour not her mother, but a man, sitting, calmly finishing his supper. There was no servant in the room. He turned, and she recognised her husband. "'Where is my mamma? she demanded without preface. "'Gone to your father's. Is that—' He stopped, aghast. "'Yes, sir. This spotted object is your wife. I've done it because I don't want you to come near me.' He was sixteen years her senior, old enough to be compassionate. "'My poor child, you must get to bed directly. Don't be afraid of me. I'll carry you upstairs and send for a doctor instantly.' "'Ah, oh, you don't know what I am,' she cried. I had a lover once, but now he's gone. T'wasn't I who deserted him. He has deserted me. Because I am ill, he wouldn't kiss me, though I wanted him to. Wouldn't he? Then he was a very poor, slack-twisted sort of fellow. Betty, I've never kissed you since you stood before me as my little wife, twelve and a half years old. May I kiss you now? Though Betty was by no means desirous of his kisses, she had enough of the spirit of Cunegunda in Schiller's ballad to test his daring. "'If you have courage to venture, yes, sir,' said she. "'But you may die for it, mind.' He came up to her, and imprinted a deliberate kiss full upon her mouth, saying, "'May many others follow.' She shook her head and hastily withdrew, though secretly pleased at his hardihood. 
The excitement had supported her for the few minutes she had passed in his presence, and she could hardly drag herself back to her room. Her husband summoned the servants, and sending them to her assistance, went off himself for a doctor. The next morning, Reynard waited at the court till he had learned from the medical man that Betty's attack promised to be a very light one, or, as it was expected, very fine, and in taking his leave he sent up a note to her. "'I must be gone. I promised your mother I would not see you yet, and she may be angered if she finds me here. Promise to see me as soon as you are well?' He was of all men living. He was, of all men then living, one of the best able to cope with such an untimely situation as this, a contriving, sagacious, gentle-mannered man, a philosopher, who saw that the only constant attribute of life is change, he held that as long as she lives, there is nothing finite in the most impassioned attitude a woman may take up. In twelve months his girl-wife's recent infatuation might be as distasteful to her mind as it now was to his own. In a few years her very flesh would change, so said the scientific, her spirit, so much more ephemeral, was capable of changing in one. Betty was his, and it became a mere question of means of how to effect that change. During the day, Mrs. Dornell, having closed her husband's eyes, returned to the court. She was truly relieved to find Betty there, even though on a bed of sickness. The disease ran its course, and in due time Betty became convalescent, without having suffered deeply for her rashness, one little speck beneath her ear, and one beneath her chin, being all the marks she retained. The squire's body was not brought back to King's Hintock. Where he was born, and where he had lived before wedding his Sue, there he had wished to be buried. No sooner had she lost him than Mrs. Dornell, like certain other wives, though she had never shown any great affection for him while he lived, awoke suddenly to his many virtues, and zealously embraced his opinion about delaying Betty's union with her husband, which she had formerly combated strenuously. Poor man! How right he was, and how wrong was I! Eighteen was certainly the lowest age at which Mr. Reynard should claim her child— Nay, it was too low, far too low. So desirous was she of honouring her lamented husband's sentiments in this respect that she wrote to her son-in-law suggesting that, partly on account of Betty's sorrow for her father's loss, and out of consideration for his known wishes for delay, Betty should not be taken from her until her nineteenth birthday. However much or little Stephen Reynard might have been to blame in his marriage, the patient man now almost deserved to be pitied. First Betty's skittishness, now her mother's remorseful volte-face. It was enough to exasperate anybody. And he wrote to the widow in a tone which led to a little coolness between those hitherto firm friends. However, knowing that he had a wife not to claim but to win, and that the young Phillipson had been packed off to sea by his parents, Stephen was complacent to a degree, returning to London, and holding quite aloof from Betty and her mother, who remained for the present in the country. In town he had a mild visitation of the distemper which he had taken from Betty, and in writing to her he took care not to dwell upon its mildness. It was now that Betty began to pity him for what she had inflicted upon him by the kiss, and her correspondence acquired a distinct flavour of kindness thenceforward. Owing to his rebuffs, Reynard had grown to be truly in love with Betty in his mild, placent, durable way, in that way which perhaps, upon the whole, tends most generally to the woman's comfort under the institution of marriage, if not particularly to her ecstasy. Mrs. Dornell's exaggeration of her husband's wish for delay in their living together was inconvenient, but he would not openly infringe it. He wrote tenderly to Betty, and soon announced that he had a little surprise in store for her. The secret was that the king had been graciously pleased to inform him privately, through a relation, that his majesty was about to offer him a barony. Would she like the title to be Ivel? Moreover, he had reason for knowing that in a few years the dignity would be raised to that of an earl, for which creation he thought the title of Wessex would be eminently suitable, considering the position of much of their property. As Lady Ivell, therefore, and future Countess of Wessex, 
he should beg leave to offer her his heart a third time. He did not add, as he might have, how greatly the consideration of the enormous estates at King's Hintock and elsewhere which Betty would inherit, and her children after her, had conduced to this desirable honour. Whether the impending titles had really any effect upon Betty's regard for him, I cannot state, for she was one of those close characters who never let their minds be known upon anything. That such an honour was absolutely unexpected by her from such a quarter, however, is certain, and she could not deny that Stephen had shown her kindness, forbearance, even magnanimity, and had forgiven her for an errant passion which he might with some reason have denounced, notwithstanding her cruel position as a child entrapped into marriage, ere able to understand its bearings. Her mother, in her grief and remorse for the loveless life she had led with her rough, though open-hearted husband, made now a creed of his merest whim, and continued to insist that, out of respect to his known desire, her son-in-law should not reside with Betty till the girl's father had been dead a year at least, at which time the girl would still be under nineteen. Letters must suffice for Stephen until then. "'It is rather long for him to wait,' "'Betty hesitatingly said one day. "'What?' said her mother. "'From you! "'Not to respect your dear father! "'Of course it is quite proper,' said Betty hastily. "'I don't gainsay it, but I was thinking that... that... "'In the long, slow months of the stipulated interval "'her mother had tended and trained Betty carefully for her duties. "'Fully awake now to the many virtues of her dear departed one, "'she, among other acts of pious devotion to his memory, "'rebuilt the church of King's Hintock Village, "'and established valuable charities in all the villages of that name, "'as far as Little Hintock, several miles eastward. "'In superintending these works, particularly that of the church building, "'her daughter Betty was her constant companion, "'and the incidents of their execution were doubtless "'not without a soothing effect upon the young creature's heart. "'She had sprung from girl to woman by a sudden bound, "'and few would have recognised in the thoughtful face of Betty now "'the same person who, the year before, "'had seemed to have absolutely no idea whatever "'of responsibility, moral or other.' Time passed thus till the squire had been nearly a year in his vault, and Mrs. Dornell was duly asked by letter by the patient Reynard if she were willing for him to come soon. He did not wish to take Betty away if her mother's sense of loneliness would be too great, but would willingly live at King's Hintock a while with them. Before the widow had replied to this communication, she one day happened to observe Betty walking on the south terrace in the full sunlight, without hat or mantle, and was struck by her child's figure. Mrs. Dornell called her in, and said suddenly, "'Have you seen your husband since the time of your poor father's death?' "'Well, yes, mamma," said Betty, colouring. "'What? Against my wishes and those of your dear father? I am shocked at your disobedience.' "'But my father said eighteen, ma'am, and you made it much longer. "'Why, of course, out of consideration for you. "'When have you seen him?' "'Well,' stammered Betty, "'in the course of his letters to me, he said that I belonged to him, "'and if nobody knew that we met, it would make no difference, "'and that I need not hurt your feelings by telling you.' "'Well?' "'So I went to Casterbridge that time you went to London, about five months ago, and met him there. "'When did you come back? "'Dear Mamma? it grew very late, and he said it was safer not to go back till next day, "'as the roads were bad, and as you were away from home.' "'I don't want to hear any more. "'Is this your respect for your father's memory?' groaned the widow. "'When did you meet him again?' "'Oh, not for more than a fortnight. "'A fortnight?' "'How many times have you seen him altogether? "'I'm sure, Mamma, I have not seen him altogether a dozen times. "'A dozen, and eighteen and a half years old, barely. "'Twice we met by accident,' pleaded Betty. "'Once at Abbot Cernel, and another time at the Red Lion, Melchester. "'Oh, thou deceitful girl!' cried Mrs. Dornell. "'An accident took you to the Red Lion whilst I was staying at the White Hart. "'I remember.' "'You came in at twelve o'clock at night "'and said you'd been to see the cathedral "'by the light of the moon. "'My ever-honoured mamma, so I had. 
I only went to the Red Lion with him afterwards. Oh, Betty, Betty, that my child should have deceived me even in my widowed days. But, my dearest mamma, you made me marry him, said Betty with spirit, and of course I've to obey him more than you now. Mrs. Dornell sighed. All I have to say is that you'd better get your husband to join you as soon as possible, she remarked. To go on playing the maiden like this, I'm ashamed to see you. She wrote instantly to Stephen Reynard. I wash my hands of the whole matter between you two, even though I should advise you to openly join each other as soon as you can, if you wish to avoid a scandal. He came, though not till the promised title had been granted, and he could call Betty archly my lady. People said in after years that she and her husband were very happy. However that may be, they had a numerous family, and she became in due course the first Countess of Wessex, as he had foretold. The little white frock in which she had been married to him at the tender age of twelve was carefully preserved among the relics at King's Hintock Court, where it may still be seen by the curious, a yellowing, pathetic testimony to the small count taken of the happiness of an innocent child in the social strategy of those days, which might have led, but providentially did not lead, to great unhappiness. When the Earl died, Betty wrote him an epitaph, in which she described him as the best of husbands, fathers, and friends, and called herself his disconsolate widow. Such is woman, or rather, not to give offence by so sweeping an assertion, such was Betty Dornell. It was at a meeting of one of the Wessex Field and Antiquarian Clubs that the foregoing story, partly told, partly read from a manuscript, was made to do duty for the regulation papers on deformed butterflies, fossil oxhorns, prehistoric dung mixins, and such like that usually occupied the more serious attention of the members. This club was of an inclusive and intersocial character, to a degree, indeed, remarkable for the part of England in which it had its being, dear, delightful Wessex, whose statuesque dynasties are even now only just beginning to feel the shaking of the new and strange spirit without, like that which entered the lonely valley of Ezekiel's vision, and made the dry bones move, where the honest squires, tradesmen, parsons, clerks, and people still praise the Lord with one voice for his best of all possible worlds. The present meeting, which was to extend over two days, had opened its proceedings at the museum of the town whose buildings and environs were to be visited by the members. Lunch had ended, and the afternoon excursion had been about to be undertaken. The rain came down in an obstinate spatter, which revealed no sign of cessation. As the members waited, they grew chilly, although it was only autumn and a fire was lighted, which threw a cheerful shine upon the varnished skulls, urns, pennates, tesserae, costumes, coats of mail, weapons, and missiles, animated the fossilized ichthyosaurus and iguanodon, while the dead eyes of the stuffed birds, those never-absent familiars in such collections, though murdered to extinction out of doors, flashed as they had flashed to the rising sun above the neighbouring moors on that fatal morning when the trigger was pulled which ended their little flight. It was then that the historian produced his manuscript, which he had prepared, he said, with a view to publication. His delivery of the story having concluded as aforesaid, the speaker expressed his hope that the constraint of the weather and the paucity of more scientific papers would excuse any inappropriateness of his subject. Several members observed that a storm-bound club could not presume to be selective, and they were all very much obliged to him for such a curious chapter from the domestic histories of the county. The president looked gloomily from the window at the descending rain, and broke a short silence by saying that, though the club had met, there seemed little probability of its being able to visit the objects of interest set down among the agenda. The treasurer observed that they had at least a roof over their heads, and they also had a second day before them. A sentimental member, leaning back in his chair, declared that he was in no hurry to get out, and that nothing would please him so much as another county story, with or without manuscript. The colonel added that the subject should be a lady, like the former, to which the gentleman known as the Spark said, Hear, hear. 
though these had spoken in jest, a rural dean who was present observed blandly that there was no lack of materials. Many, indeed, were the legends and traditions of gentle and noble dames, renowned in times past in that part of England, whose actions and passions were now, but for men's memories, buried under the brief inscription on a tomb or an entry of dates in a dry pedigree. Another member, an old surgeon, a somewhat grim though sociable personage, was quite of the speaker's opinion, and felt quite sure that the memory of the reverend gentleman must abound with such curious tales of fair dames, of their loves and hates, their joys and their misfortunes, their beauty and their fate. The parson, a trifle confused, retorted that their friend the surgeon, the son of a surgeon, seemed to him as a man who had seen much and heard more during the long course of his own and his father's practice, the member of all others the most likely to be acquainted with such lore. The bookworm, the colonel, the historian, the vice-president, the church-warden, the two curates, the gentleman tradesman, the sentimental member, the crimson maltster, the quiet gentleman, the man of family, the spark, and several others quite agreed, and begged that he would recall something of the kind. The old surgeon said that, though a meeting of the Mid-Wessex Field and Antiquarian Club was the last place at which he should have expected to be called upon in this way, he had no objection, and the parson said he would come next. The surgeon then reflected, and decided to relate the history of a lady named Barbara, who lived towards the end of the last century, apologizing for his tale being perhaps a little too professional. The crimson maltster winked to the spark at hearing the nature of the apology, and the surgeon began. End of chapter 1, part 2